Our patient is a 62-year-old lady who works as a chef. She injured her shoulder and tore her rotator cuff. She underwent a rotator cuff repair within the last year, and that has failed. Her supraspinatus is retracted back to her glenoid, and her subscapularis has failed. And we see on her x-rays that her humeral head sits in a sublux position anteriorly. Another attempt at a rotator cuff repair is unlikely to give her any benefit in terms of function or pain relief. And because of her underlying problem with the deficient rotator cuff, our plan is to proceed with a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. This, uh, she's, uh, this uh, should give her excellent pain relief and stability of her shoulder without worrying about the ability for the rotator cuff tendon to heal. So we'll go ahead and get started with this right shoulder arthroplasty and we'll identify our landmarks from the clavicle down to the axilla. We can place a mark and we'll identify the coracoid process. We can oftentimes just roll our marking pen just off the edge of the coracoid and mark our deltal pectoral interval which will give us our access for our shoulder, whether we're doing an anatomic shoulder replacement or a reverse shoulder replacement, as we're doing in this case here. A surgical timeout has been performed, and now we're proceeding with the operation. In addition to the interscaling block that she receives, we also will anesthetize the skin for a deltal pectoral incision. We'll proceed through the skin, and then we'll take our Gelpie self-retaining retractors and as we go through the skin, what we're looking for is our first landmark for our delta pectoral interval, which is the plane of the fat, which identifies where our cephalic vein is located. So once we identify the fat stripe, that will tell us where the deltoid and the pectoralis major are, and we'll unroof the vein. And ideally, we'll take the vein laterally with the deltoid which is where it gets its primary contribution. So we'll proceed more proximally, keeping a close eye on the vein, trying to protect that from injury. As we get more proximal, we'll try to identify the separation between the, the deltoid and the pec to major, which will then give us the plane where our, our coracoid process is located. Once we lift off the deltoid from the pectoralis and we know exactly where the coracoid is, we can take our point and Holman retractor and slide that underneath the deltoid over the top of the coracoid and the coracochromial ligament. And this will give us an excellent retraction uh, laterally so that we can, again, continue to develop this plane between the deltoid and the pectoralis major. Once we're down to that inferior border of the pectoralis major tendon, will again identify the coracoid process. We see the coracobrachialis. We then see off to the left or lateral side ad additional uh, fibrous tissue, which is related to the short head of the biceps. And then lateral to that is the red tissue or the muscle of the short head. So we refer to this as the white stripe and the red stripe. And we'll go just lateral to that red stripe to go through the clavipectoral fascia to proceed through our next layer. And in this layer, we would expect to get some joint fluid, which we do right away, because of the failure of our subscapularis, which we know from, which we can be highly suspicious of based on our preoperative radiographs, and we can confirm from our preoperative MRI. And typically, what we'd like to do is release approximately a centimeter to a centimeter or a half of the pectoralis major tendon inferiorly. And just behind us will be the long head of the biceps tendon in this position. And then once we get to the superior part of the coracochromial ligament, we'll remove our homin and put it underneath that ligament and over the top of the humerus to prepare for the, uh, the exposure of the next layer. Now, because she has a subscapularis failure, there's gonna be significant adhesions underneath the coracoid process, but we'd like to be able to establish our retractor in this area, so we'll open this up safely, staying lateral to the short head of the biceps and proceeding right underneath the coracoid process. Inferiorly is where we'll start to run into our three sisters or the anterior circumflex vessels and our axillary nerve even deep to that. So we just want to make enough exposure here that we can get our retractor in place and that feels good on the medial side. Then for our lateral side, we'll abduct the arm and internally rotate and then we'll free this up by going just underneath the deltoid and proceeding over the top of the rotator cuff, which is, again, 
going to be deficient over the top, which we already know from our preoperative testing. And we'll take this out. We'll see if we can get a plane in there for our retractor. It feels like we have one, so we'll try a medium and a small. Our handle is put in this position to hold the blades in a good spot so they don't slide out easily. And then we'll open up this tissue and start to get our deeper exposure. We can see the subscapularis has failed, the supraspinatus has failed, and as we look inferiorly here, we're looking for the biceps tendon, and the biceps tendon was uh, released or has uh, been torn from the previous uh, surgical procedure that she's already undergone. We will, however, externally rotate the arm, and we'll look at the inferior aspect, and we can identify the anterior circumflex vessels, and we'll go ahead and ligate those with some number one vical sutures to try to minimize the bleeding that can occur from those. So at this layer of exposure, uh, we've taken care of the biceps tendon, which in this case has autotenides. We have ligated our anterior circumflex vessels, and now we're ready to take down the subscapularis. As we've already mentioned, the subscapularis is deficient superiorly, but we can still find the bicipital groove and proceed through the rotator interval. And with our reverse prosthesis, we routinely perform a peeling of the subscapularis or whatever tissue is available directly off of the lesser tuberosity. Now, we, there is some controversy as to whether the subscapularis needs to be repaired at the conclusion of the surgery. Hemostat, please. And certainly if we have a good subscapularis, our plan is to repair it uh, to provide uh, some function anteriorly. But in cases like this where the subscapularis tissue is highly deficient, most likely at the end of the procedure, we will not be repairing the subscapularis. This tissue is not going to be functional and it may cause a contracture of the anterior aspect of her shoulder. And fortunately, the reverse prosthesis is designed in a way to stabilize the shoulder even without the subscapularis being intact. Now we'll proceed inferiorly with our release and we go down until we see the white fibers of this tendon right here, which is our latissimus tendon, attached into the medial intertubercular ridge of the bicipital groove. And once we are that in that uh, distal extent, we can then continue to proceed more inferior and then posterior on the humerus to perform our release of the capsule. We always go to at least the six o'clock position on the humerus and further as necessary to get a nice release of the soft tissues. Now, we'll go ahead and take our Holman retractor out. We can put our sutures in our subscapularis, which is what we routinely do, but again, this is very deficient. So we'll go ahead and take our Facuda retractor and we'll internally rotate the humerus. We'll place our Facuda across the glenohumeral joint, catch the posterior glenoid, and sublux the humerus posteriorly to get a better view of what's going on with the subscapularis. And these are the fibers that we have left here. We'll go ahead and take our number two fiber wire and we'll take two of them to try to control this tissue. Even though we may, uh, in fact, uh, not repair this at the end of the procedure, we want to prepare for that each and every case. And there we have our subscapularis. Now, we're going to go ahead and uh, identify where our axillary nerve is, which is down very low and we'll start to release our, our capsule at this inferior margin of the subscapularis. And then we'll take our tissue from the superior aspect underneath our coracoid and perform our release in this position down through the middle glenohumeral ligament. Once we've done our anterior release, we'll take our Dara retractor across the glenohumeral joint and then we'll shoehorn the humeral head out. And essentially it's a, a, what we would refer to as a bald head with very little attached at any position. So these can be quite challenging in terms of figuring out exactly where to make your humeral head cut. And so in an effort to identify the best position, we'll use a humeral cutting guide uh, to uh, formalize our cut. There are two different styles of, of arthroplasty, one with the typical Grammont style, 155 inclination on the humeral side, and another with the 135. There's now other devices that will allow something in between those two uh, inclinations as, tr as an attempt at a compromise of the two levels. What we've identified is that the 135 inclination minimizes the risk of notching, does not increase the risk of instability, and 
a systematic review of the world's literature suggests that the overall range of motion clinically is the same. So we prefer the 135 in the majority of our patients because we can avoid the notching, which may play a role in uh, the late loosening of our glenoid components. So to identify exactly where we need to go down the canal, we can see our bicipital groove is here. And then we'll come just anterior and posterior, excuse me, anterior and towards the center of the humeral head uh, to identify the humeral canal. We'll get our guide pin to go down through the center of the humeral canal. And then we'll start with our smallest reamer, the size 5. We're going straight down the canal. We can actually feel that to make sure that we're not pushing this into the wrong direction. And we're trying to identify the normal humeral axis. So here's a 5. We're going to try a 6 and prepare that canal. And the 6 is going down readily. And most likely, if it uh, is large enough to fit a 6, we'll put a 6. So we'll leave the, the actual uh, reamer in place. And then we have a guide system, which will allow us to identify the inclination that we want, which is, in this patient will be a 135, as well as the version. And we can select the height. We'll slide this over the handle and drop this down. And oftentimes, we can do a relatively minimalistic cut on the humerus, especially in these smaller patients, to try to maintain the bone as much as possible. It can be challenging to know exactly where the version is at, so we'll put in a version guide rod. This one is at the 20 degree mark, and this is at the 40 degree mark. And by keeping the forearm in this position, that allows us to identify the best site for our, our retro version. And this is dialed in for the 135 inclination. But this is lined up with the forearm. We have our inclination in place, and we're down the humeral canal, so we have good overall alignment. It, it's quite easy to see that we can put our first guide pin across, and I can see out the back to ensure we're not causing any harm to the other tissues. Now, our second guide pin will go off the top of the humeral head. But fortunately, what we can do is we have a diagonal guide, which will allow us to go ahead and capture the humeral head uh, just to make our cut for the humerus. So that little angle will just help us out in that position. So now we'll take out our retroversion guide rods. We'll disconnect this from our cutting guide and we'll slide this off and then we'll take our T-handle and remove our central reamer and then we'll take our saw and make our saw cut. And we can make our saw cut just as easily here, but to get us a little bit closer to the actual humerus, uh, these pins are designed to be breakaway pins, which gives us a little bit better access down to our cutting block. And then we'll hold this in position. Okay, this uh, humeral head can be used as a bone graft. If we saw in our preoperative x-rays that there was a defect in the glenoid, then oftentimes this segment of the humeral head fits very nicely exactly in that defect. We don't see a defect on the glenoid, so we won't need it for this case, but in cases of primary cuff tear arthropathy, it's not unusual for the humeral head to erode superior and posterior, and oftentimes the humeral head makes the best graft to fill that defect Okay, there we go. We'll take this top one out. And we'll take our head cut protector, as it looks like we'll probably be using the size 36 glenosphere and humeral cup. Okay. And then we'll place our Dara retractor across the, glen across the glenohumeral joint. We'll bring in our mail stand and we'll start to expose our glenoid, which we actually already started with our initial exposure. So some of the other tricks that we use, we can take out our extra Cobell retractor, and we'll take an anterior glenoid retractor to place over the front of the glenoid rim. And this will get our exposure and our lighting much better on the glenoid. We'll internally rotate, and I'm going to release the inferior and posterior capsule to give a little bit more translation posteriorly. And we'll stay right on the glenoid rim to do this. And this is particularly important in patients that have had previous rotator cuff surgery. This capsule can be very, very tight. If we need to see the top, we can always put a retractor up here, but most of our focus on reverse arthroplasty 
is the lower two-thirds of the glenoid. So our exposure here is just fine. We'll take a large curette and we're going to remove the soft tissue that's remaining on our glenoid and just scrape off this cartilage. We may not see much of this cartilage in a patient with cuff tear arthropathy, especially the superior glenoid, but this patient with failed rotator cuff disease, it's not unusual to have a fair amount of cartilage and we'd like to clean that off so we can identify the true bony landmarks of our glenoid. We can uh, tell from our preoperative x-rays that our version for this patient looks to be within normative data and normal for this patient. We don't have any significant erosions. We're just going to identify the superior to inferior and anterior to posterior plane. I know this is our center line, but with the reverse prosthesis, what we're primarily interested in is the curvature of the inferior part of the glenoid or the diameter of the inferior part of the glenoid. And we're going to look at the center of that where we're going to place our small glenoid component. We'll put our small glenoid component so it lines up just at that inferior edge. Sometimes uh, that we, we have to change the handle around if we can't get this in a good position. But one of the key things we want to do is avoid superior tilt to our glenoid. So we put this right at the bottom. And if it comes off the glenoid just a little bit at the top, that provides a, a few degrees of superior, of inferior tilt, which is ideal or neutral or inferior tilt is what we're aiming for. And we'll place this into the center zero degree guide position and go down until you see the three laser lines. And this will tell us when we've gone through the scapular cortex and we're starting to hit the hard bone now. So most likely our center screw will be the 15, which is the smallest one. And then there's a 20 and a 25. We'll back out our guide and slide this out over our guide pin and then ream the face of our glenoid to prepare this for our faceplate. So we can kind of see that if we look at the diameter of the inferior part of the glenoid, this is in a good position. There's a slight inferior tilt. We can use this guide to help us if there's a significant retroversion problem. We can drill at zero degrees, we can drill at 15 degrees or 20 degrees or make a correction with our guide pin. We put the guide pin in place based on the face of the glenoid and then we can prepare the glenoid based on that and that also tells us about the size of a bone graft that we may need to fill that defect. Again, in this case here, it's a zero degrees deformity so we're in good shape with that. We'll then take our center coring reamer and prepare the face of the glenoid with that. And then we'll come in with our peripheral reamer. And our goal here is just to prepare at least 75% or more of the face of the glenoid. And we'll start out very slowly here. This oftentimes will uh, gently bump against our retractors. So we just have to kind of work those things together. And then once it bottoms out, we're done. And then we'll take a little irrigation and we'll see how our preparation has come along. Our center reaming is good, and then inferiorly we're excellent, and even all the way around the top we have a ridge all the way around, so we've got the glenoid adequately repaired, we have the glenoid adequately prepared, and we're gonna be ready for our small component. We wanna re remove a little bit more of the soft tissue, let's have a rongeur. We just wanna make sure that that doesn't get interposed between the implant and the glenoid face. This looks excellent. We can see it circumferentially in place. We'll take our guide pin out with our pin driver, and then we'll take our anatomically designed glenoid component. Uh, this glenoid component, as you see, has two levels, and that's why we have the double level reaming. This provides a tremendous amount of surface area for bone ingrowth. It also has a, a macro ingrowth with a grit blasting, and then on top of that is a coating, a bone it, which is calcium phosphate, which allows bone ingrowth. So this is a, a very a stable by its design and geometry at time zero and then has excellent uh, characteristics with re regards to getting the bone to grow into the implant. We'll seat this down into the prepared position. Try not to let that s slip off our inserter. We'll dial that into our anatomic position so we want to line that up from top to bottom. And then once we're in a good spot we can go ahead and impact that into place there. So we can see that well. Watch your eyes. Okay. 
And we can see our glenoid component is nice and seated. There is even a little ridge of bone inferiorly, which is ideal. And all the way around, we have a nice uh, seating of the glenoid component. Now we're going to lock that into place. We have an inferior locking screw. We can feel for our scapula, but typically it's slightly inferior and slightly anterior. But really, the mo for the most part, these are relatively horizontal. It's not that advantageous to try to put these on a very steep incline down into the scapula. Now what we're also trying to do is we're looking at our guide system here, which tells us how deep the screw, the drill is, which tells us how deep the drill is going in. So then we know the size of the screw. So, so now we're going on to 30, still in bone the entire way. And then we give way just at the 30 mark. So we'll go ahead and take the 30. Now to hold the grommet in the best position, we'll unscrew the guide and back this out over the top of our pit, our drill. And then once that's released, we just pull that out directly. And this holds the grommet from changing its position. And we'll line that up in the same way that we drilled. And it should catch the grommet correctly and then seat itself very nicely. This will prevent the glenoid component from tilting superiorly as we go to the next screw. So we'll lean back again a little bit on this. We know that we just have to go to a 15. So we'll tap this area down so we break through the cortex. This bone can be, even uh, in uh, some of our osteoporotic patients, can be quite hard. So we want to make sure that we go through that layer so we can get the screw seated properly. Once we're through that layer, we'll take our, this screw again as a 15 millimeter based on what we saw in our preparation. And we'll put that into place. Now, it can sometimes be difficult to know for sure. I can certainly feel that it was seated all the way. But we certainly want to check that to make sure it doesn't impact our abilities to seat our glenoid. So we have a little checking device, and it's got a pin at the bottom. And if the pin goes all the way down, we see green. And any part of that green tells us that the center screw won't impact our ability to get a good fit on the Morris taper from the glenosphere to the base plate. And then we'll put our last screw in place. And now we're going to go relatively horizontal, but aim anterior to the base of our coracoid. We want to stay horizontal because we don't want the screw or the drill to go into the base of the spine of the scapula, which may weaken that area of the scapular bone. Again, we're paying attention to how deep our drill is going. So there's the 24, there's the 30. I still have good bone contact. The 30, it's starting to hit some harder bone, so it looks like it's going to probably be the 36. We'll see how this goes. Yep, there we go, right? The 36, it gave way, so that's where we want to be. We'll undo our drill guide, back out our drill, and we'll take the 36 screw and finalize the seating and fixation of our base plate. These base plates have been uh, spectacular in terms of their fixation. We haven't had any of these come loose. The only time that a removal has been done has uh, been for uh, infection. And when we get close to the actual base plate, it'll engage the grommet and then lock that into its final position, as you see here, and be nice and secure, and we're all set. Okay, so that looks great. So it's a small patient, as we talked about. So we're going to use the 36 glenosphere. Now, we could use the standard 36 medialized glenosphere if we were doing more of the Grammont style. But my preference is to use the 36 lateral offset plus 4 uh, as our glenosphere because this puts the center of rotation in a more anatomic position and balances out not only the remaining rotator cuff but the other soft tissues around the shoulder, including the deltoid, in a much more anatomic position. And we've seen where if you use a lateral offset on your glenosphere, even if you don't have good quality rotator cuff, you can improve your patient's external rotation after surgery. So it's definitely my preference. Now before we put our glenosphere down, we need to make sure that no bony prominence or soft tissue prominence will interfere with the ability of the glenosphere to seat itself. So we'll put our peripheral reamer in place here. And we'll clean off the rest of the glenoid to make sure soft tissue and their bone are removed so the glenosphere will seat itself very nicely. And once that's done, then we're ready to insert our glenosphere. We have three ways to insert our glenosphere. One is with a clamp that we can slide in here, which we could easily do here with the exposure we have. 
Another method is to use this tripod, and some surgeons prefer to use this and push back on the humerus and drop the glenosphere in place. Sometimes because of surgery or the contracture or the difficulty of getting the releases, we can't get the exposure we need to get the glenosphere in place. And so in a last ditch effort, the final uh, technique would be to prepare your humerus, create the bony socket that will be the cup for the humerus, and then before you put your implant in place, you take your glenosphere and insert it into that socket, then rotate the humerus and it will drop immediately down into place. So this is a, another technique that some surgeons like and use and can work very well. What I prefer to do in the majority of my cases, we'll place a bone hook through the center of our, of our actual humeral head cut. We'll relax on our posterior retractor just so we can slide underneath it. So we just kind of just put gentle tension on that. We'll have our assistant lift up the arm and just pull on the bone hook, which keeps it off of the face of the glenoid. And then we can slide this in. You see the, the glenoid is in place here. We want to make sure that it's away from the two ridges. And we'll slide this down and drop this right in to our actual glenoid base plate here. Move that away. And slide that across. And of course, we're getting that. And then we'll unpack this into its final resting position. And then we'll take our clamp that we can wrap around the glenosphere. And we'll check and make sure that our Morse taper is engaged so we can wrap it around the glenosphere and pull on this and see that we can literally lift the patient off the table. So this is plenty of security. And then we'll take our bone hook here and we'll just put a little traction and slide forward across our glenosphere and then past our glenosphere and then out. There we go. And go ahead and move the mail stand. We'll slide underneath our deltoid, just hold that straight up. Now we'll take our little elevator and elevate off our humeral head cut protector. And we'll begin to prepare our humeral side here. And we'll put that off to the side just a little bit so that we can see everything nicely. Okay. We had the six reamer in place, and I don't think we're going to go any larger than that, so we'll go ahead and start with our six brooch. And then we'll take our version rods. We'll put these down in our, our actual outrigger here, which slides onto our implant. will help hold us to our cut surface, but we can also check with our version rods here approximately and make sure that we're running these in the right position. So here's one at 20, and here's one at 40, and our forearm should sit right in between. So it's just another check. We have a couple of different checks. We have the cut surface that we can check, which is down here, and we have the version rods, and we can tell that the humor, that we can tell that the forearm is sitting right in between the two, and that helps us to identify this in the best position. Then we'll take our mallet and we'll sink this down, and we've got to go down to the 135 inclination that we see on our device. And we'll just follow that on down. Almost down. Okay, then we'll take this off, take the handle off, and now we're going to judge the placement of our brooch within the prepared bone. Now, with most systems, <clears throat> we'll basically prepare the humeral cup in line with the humeral axis, but just like we see with anatomic shoulder arthroplasty, there is a normal offset to the proximal end or the epiphysis of the humerus, the humeral head in a more posterior direction, which can be two to four millimeters. So we have the ability to adjust to that with this system. So we're gonna take the size 36 humeral cup reamer, but we're gonna displace it to the right or posterior two millimeters to put this more centered within the actual proximal humerus. So we'll take the, 130, uh, the 135 inclination plus two to the right with the size 36. So. This is the one to the right, and this is the neutral one, so you can see it puts it back about two millimeters, so that when we put this down the humeral canal, we can look at a couple of things. Number one, we can see where this is sitting with respect to the entire diameter, and it looks like in a good position, and we can sit, see that it's sitting more posterior than our actual brooch, which is ideal to what we'd like to do for this reconstruction. And then we use this guide to prepare the humerus. We'll go all the way down till it seats itself. And suction, please. And that prepares the cup for our humerus. We'll take out our guide. 
And then we'll take the, the actual cup and put this in place. So it's a 135 inclination, 36 cup, displaced two millimeters to the right for our offset. And this sits in nicely with respect to the bone. We can resect a little bit of the bone to clean it off. So let's have a rongeur. And we'll start with our smallest one because it looks like this will be in a good position for a plus three. We have the ability to trial a number of different sizes. This is the plus three. Let's see a plus six. It's very easy for us to take these out and put them back in. Here's a plus six where we can put it in. And if we don't like that, it's very easy to take this out. But it's in fixed, and we can really do a much better reasonable trial of our system with these instead of the pieces that kind of move all over the place. We'll remove this retractor first. We'll use this retractor essentially as a skid to glide this in place. And then we'll take two fingers with a slight lateral displacement and push this lateral, and it goes in pretty gently and easily, as we see here. It goes in and pops into place. So for me, this is not bad, but I think it's a little bit loose, and I'd like her shoulder to be a little bit tighter. It works out pretty well, but uh, I think we can definitely go up to a plus six. And then we'll take our hemostat, and we'll see the plus six. Now we're going to go to the plus six, and again, the maneuver is to just take two fingers and to glide this over the top of the glenosphere, and then see if this will pop into place. That one actually came together very nicely and feels nice and solid and secure. So this one I, I like, and it feels like there's whenever I move it, it's not uh, open booking on a glenosphere. We have nice rotation internal, externals, and stable. So we'll take the plus six with the 135 inclination, the 36 with a plus two to the right. That is correct. And we'll separate out our components again. The maneuver is to take the bone hook to support the arm and pull laterally and slide the cup past the glenosphere. Now we talked about earlier about the subscapularis and we may not be able to repair it, but we do like to be in a position to repair it if we can. So we will go ahead and put a few number two, number five fiber wires in position uh, to have the ability to repair our subscapularis if any of the fibers look like they're worthwhile repairing and if it does not cause any contracture to our shoulder. We're just removing the implants that were in place and then our subscapularis repair is going to be along the rim of the osteotomy. We know that this upper tissue is not going to be very valuable, so we'll put it a little bit lower than that. And we'll prepare the bone just a little bit on the lesser tuberosity, just in case some of this can be repaired. So we'll go ahead and take our number two fiber wire. Here's our bicipital groove, and in a normal subscap repair, we'd start up here, but generally we can start some distance away from that and we'll put in two or three to repair the subscapularis if possible. Okay. Hemostat, please. So we have our, our stem, which has a relatively smooth and tapered uh, distal tip. It has a rectangular section as it goes from the diaphyseal to the metaphysis section. And then in the metaphyseal section, we have a grit-blasted, area that is covered with calcium phosphate, otherwise known as bonet. And so this is what gives excellent fixation to this implant, both in rotation as well as in height. We have options to either put this in the 155 position or the 135 position, as we've already talked about. We've selected the 135, and we'll make sure it goes into that place. But you can see that this could just as easily be put in a 155 which would then match the typical Grammont style of, of a reverse. But our preference is a more anatomic in the 135 inclination, which will match with this patient well. We feel that this will limit the risk of notching medially. It does not increase the risk of instability. And the range of motion in terms of elevation is the same. And along with a lateral offset glenosphere, we have improved external rotation. So there's a lot of features that we feel are advantageous for our patients, particularly our younger patients that are trying to get a very functional result. We'll tighten down that screw in position. And as we tighten it, we want to check and make sure that the notch is sitting directly within the notch of the cup. We don't want it perched on the edge before we do the final seating 
of the implant and we'll tighten that securely in that position. Then we're going to insert it into its proper position and we have an insertion guide. So it's got a central screw that goes down into the, the hole that's available. Uh, this would be put slightly different if this was a 155, of course, and it sits in the cup like we see here. And then we can load the screwdriver onto the inserter and drive this down into the stem of the humerus. So that's how we get this all set up and ready to go. And once this has been seated properly, then we'll put in our humeral cup. So we'll bring this into the humerus. We'll insert this down into position. We'll take our suction. And, and what we'd like to do is just seat this down. There's no intention to try to drive this further down into the humerus. Our goal is just to seat this into the position. We'll go ahead and suction, please, that we prepared uh, when we did our trial implant. And so we'll go down just a little bit further. All right, we're getting some nice humeral bleeding support. Plenty of, and we'll place this into the center here and then impact it into a final resting position. Go ahead and hit that for me. Okay, we'll check and make sure it's down all the way around, and it is. And then one final check to make sure that the bone is not in any way going to impinge or strike. We can actually clean off just a little bit more inferior. Let's have a rongeur, please. A little posterior and inferior just to make sure that that sits nicely with respect to the glenoid. Now that we've got our implant in place and we're seated nicely, we can then take our two fingers and drop this down into position and it will snap into place. We'll hear that sound like that and then we check. We have nice rotation, good internal rotation, good external rotation without it open booking, good forward elevation and so we're in a nice place with this one. So now we'll bring the Mayo stand back into place. So we'll take the tissue of our subscapularis, but ideally what we'd like to do is rotate the arm at least 35 to 40 degrees and pull our tissue over. And what we can see is that there is actually some reasonable tissue, but it doesn't go all the way back to the normal position on the humerus. But this is reasonable tissue, and we can use our lower two sutures to repair this to the inferior aspect. Uh, it is possible just to let that um, go and not to repair it, but there is some function of the lower subscapularis and we'll go ahead and repair that into place and we'll repair down the subscapularis tissue that we have. The lower part will be a little bit better than this upper part but it'll be under minimal tension and help to again create a nice soft tissue envelope uh, for, our implant and uh, for our implant and help that encapsulate into a good position. And then we can remove our tag stitches. And we can just check our repair. We see there we've got some tissue that's repaired down to the edge, which just, again, gives us a nice restraint at the end point. But it doesn't stop us from getting the patient's motion back, and we get some soft tissue coverage in this area. We'll take our pulsatile lavage and do a final washout. In some cases where it's a procedure that's been done after another procedure, we can consider the use of uh, antibiotics either antibiotics in the cement or placing antibiotics in a powdered form over the top of our, of our implant. This was a patient who had one procedure. There's been no history of infection. And overall, the tissues looked in excellent condition. So we won't provide any other additional prophylaxis for antibiotics and the typical antibiotics before we start the procedure and then the antibiotics uh, for the 24 hours after the procedure. And we'll repair our deltal pectoral interval. We just completed a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty in a 62-year-old lady who injured her shoulder while she was working. She had an attempt at a rotator cuff repair, which failed and left her with an irreparable rotator cuff, including not only the supraspinatus, but part of the infraspinatus and the upper half of the subscapularis. We really have very few options in these patients, 
and the appropriate management for her, especially as she was developing early arthritis or the stage four of Hamada, where there's arthritis, superior migration of the humeral head, and a deficient rotator cuff. The best operation for this patient, the most reliable operation for this patient, is a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. The procedure went very well. Her bone uh, tolerated the implants very nicely. She had very secure fixation on the glenosphere. We elected to proceed with a 135 inclination to minimize her risk of notching over any type of other placement of the humeral stem. And we did a lateral offset of approximately four millimeters, which places the center of rotation closer to the normal anatomic center of rotation. This helps also with avoiding the notching, but in addition, it tensions the soft tissues that are still present and still relevant around the shoulder, particularly the deltoid, and allows that patient to reestablish some of her external rotation, which she had very little strength with uh, prior to the surgical treatment. After the surgery, uh, she will go to the recovery room, and then she will spend uh, one day with us. We do have some patients who are admitted to the hospital and they can actually go home that evening if they're doing well. But most of our patients with reverse shoulder arthroplasty will spend one night. The interscaling block will wear off. We will make sure that their pain is adequately controlled with oral medications, and then they're ready to go home. Our early postoperative management is very simple, much easier than the rotator cuff management uh, that she underwent already. And that is that the patients are in a sling and an immobilizer. We allow them to do hand, wrist, and elbow range of motion. And in some of our patients, if they're comfortable enough, we may even initiate a little bit of pendulum exercises. At six weeks, they come out of their sling and immobilizer, and we send them for some supervised physical therapy to be instructed in home exercises that they can do in terms of forward elevation, external rotation, internal rotation, and strengthening. Most of the patients are incredibly surprised at how well their arm moves despite having no rehabilitation for the first six weeks, and they can raise their arm up and use their arm for activities of daily living. They're also very pleased with the amount of pain relief they get within the first seven to 10 days after the surgery. From six to 12 weeks, they're doing their exercises, and at 12 weeks, the majority of patients can do the rest of the rehabilitation on their own. And by six months, they're fully recovered and using their arm for many activities which they couldn't do before their surgery. Uh, these implants are, are very secure and very stable, and we believe that 90% of them will be in more than 10 years, probably 70% more than 15 years. And so this is a reliable operation. Your patient who has a rotator cuff deficient shoulder, whether it's a cuff tear arthropathy or rotator cuff deficiency after failed surgical attempt at repair. Uh, so th this is uh, the reverse arthroplasty provides a great opportunity to help your patients in terms of their comfort, their range of motion, and their function after this challenging problem presents in their shoulder.